Hey guys, welcome back to another video. Today we're going to be talking about private company valuation. And this is the part two video in the two part video series on private company valuation. So the first part was really discussing the high level methodology and the thinking behind the comparable company approach. In the second video, we are going to be looking at four real life companies and actually going through the valuation exercise, taking the enterprise value, thinking through the multiple range, and then also valuing the balance sheet and looking at the net working capital excess value that may be on the balance sheet. So these are real life examples. I've kind of tweaked the numbers, changed the industries a little bit, but these are from past transactions that we've worked on at Robley Capital. So just getting into, into it right now. Um, we're going to do a quick recap first, and as you can see over here, this is the formula that we use. So we look at the enterprise value of the company, which the enterprise value is the adjusted EBITDA, or it could be another benchmark, multiplied by a valuation multiple in addition to the excess balance sheet value, which is excess net working capital or maybe a deficit, in addition to cash, excess cash that is available for the seller. Because in most instances, when a business sells, it's on a cash-free, debt-free basis. So the excess cash stays with the seller. So it's the enterprise value, which is really the value of the cash flow, plus the value of the business is what gives you the value of the company. And so usually when I go and I try to approach a client, whether on the buy side or the sell side, and we talk about valuation, they, these are kind of the five steps that I follow. I want to get a really good understanding of the financial and business. So that typically means getting three to four years of financials, the EBITDA schedule, breakdown of owner salaries and expenses, and then really delving into the business model, pricing, getting an understanding of how the business makes money and where it ranks relative to the competitive marketplace in that industry. Now, with that information, I will then calculate the normalized EBITDA or the financial benchmark that I'll use to get my enterprise value. And then Looking at that size of the EBITDA, I am going to identify the multiple range. So what is the, in general terms, the range for the size of this business? And so as you can see over here, the multiple ranges increase as the size of the EBITDA increases. So for a 200,000 EBITDA business, it would be in that first row over here. So it could trade for anywhere from two to four times. A 4 million EBITDA business is very sizable, a lot of infrastructure. So it will typically trade for a higher multiple, maybe six to eight times. So you want to first start at a high level in placing that business based on its size characteristics within a certain range. And then really number four is you now incorporate the company specific value drivers and limiters within that range to zero, zero in on where in that range would a, this business specifically trade for. So yes, maybe there are two businesses that both generate $2 million in EBITDA, but one has a management team, one has contracted revenues, and the other, the owner is heavily involved in the business and doesn't have contracted revenues. Well, while the profits may be the same, the multiple will be higher for the first business because, again, lower transition risk, the customer, the customer contracts provide stability for the transition. So there are factors that will influence where you rank within that range, and that's what you want to do in step four. And then ultimately, once you get a general sense of the EV, you then add in the balance sheet value, which is you want to calculate the networking capital target. And you look at relative to the target, which is essentially the required amount of working capital for that business. If there's an excess amount of working capital relative to the target, then that increases the value. But maybe the owner has drained the AR, uh, is running the business very lean and doesn't carry a lot of inventory on the books. And therefore, it will need more working capital to support that business, in which case it would lower the overall value of the business. So that's really just a very, very quick recap of the valuation process. So now we'll really get into it. Now, I've already made a video on this, but I thought I'd add this slide in simply because, you know, as we're going to talk about adjusted EBITDA, it's important to understand that EBITDA is not the financial EBITDA that you would see on the income statement. At the end of the day, in most instances for private business owners, they will run personal expenses through the business, or they will not draw a salary to account for their services and instead live off of only dividends. So there are certain normalizations that need to be made to the financial statement EBITDA, which is done through this normalization process. So I would recommend that you watch the full video on my channel if you want to really get into in depth into this topic. But at a high level, these are the primary categories that we see adjusted EBITDA 
relates to. The first is owner salary, as I said. Maybe there are family members in the business that are being paid a salary, but they don't do anything. Well, obviously they're not needed and that's not a needed expense. So that expense would be added back or vice versa. An owner works 80 hours a week in the business, but doesn't draw a salary. Well, you probably need to hire two people to replace that owner's role. And therefore you need to factor in two market level salaries to account for that owner's uh, services. There are benefits such as personal travel, meals and entertainment, insurance costs. So all these personal expenses or discretionary expenses that are not needed for the business to operate, those would be added back. It may be intercompany rent if the owner also owns the property that the business operates in and they don't charge themselves market rent, but then they want the buyer to pay themselves market rent. Well, hold on a second. If you haven't charged yourself market rent, but you want me to, then I need a normalized historical financials to account for the business always paying market rent. There could be one-time costs, subsidies like COVID subsidies, one-time profits like the disposal and gain of assets uh, of equipment sales, or there could be also realized synergies. If uh, you know I'm a strategic buyer and I'm buying your business and I know that I'm not going to need these three employees, then maybe we normalize the EBITDA to account for what the EBITDA is to you as a strategic buyer. So these are all the primary categories. I again, I don't want to go too much into detail, but here is a simple EBITDA breakdown for the first company that we're going into. So I'm only going to do this for the first one, just so that you can see. So what you want to do is you want to start with the net income that you would see on the financial statements. You would then add back the income taxes because EBITDA is earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, amortization. And then we, we use these categories and normalize the financials. So in addition to income taxes, they had a gain on the disposal of of assets in 2020 of 23,000. So we're going to deduct that from the net income of the business because they received uh, received a return on that, but that's not really related to the business. It's the disposal of assets. Then there's the amortization, which is non-cash charge and that added back. And then we look at the shareholder salary. So in this instance, this shareholder is paying themselves 109,000, 120, 98,000 in the last four years. Okay. But really they perform market level services, if you were to hire someone to take over that role and run that business for them, you would need to pay in the open market 150000 for the amount of work that the owner is doing and the responsibilities in that role today. Therefore, if they're only paying themselves 109000 but the market salary for my position is one hundred and fifty, then there's a downwards adjustment to profit to account for really the true cost of ownership, the true cost of that role. And so that's what's being done here. Then there's personal vehicle and insurance. So these are personal expenses run through the business. You know, the owner was driving a Mercedes and leased the Mercedes to the business for tax advantageous purposes. But again, that Mercedes is not needed to deliver the service. Therefore, it is added back. There's charitable donations. So $60,000 donation to university. This was simply the owner wanted to give back to the community. But again, that's not needed to generate customers or to generate sales. And therefore, it would be added back. A discretionary life insurance policy, again, is specific to that owner. Maybe the own, new owner does not have a life insurance policy, so they may not need to incur this expense. And then another one here is the rent. So this, and for this specific business, they had a 13,400 square foot building. And so historically, they always paid themselves about the same market rent of 107,000. But now selling the business to the new buyer, they're asking for $10 a square foot for the 13,400 square feet. Therefore, you need to normalize for the true cost of this real estate, not what I paid myself historically because I own the building as well and I can charge myself whatever I want, but what is really market in this instance, which is $10 a square foot. So I add back the historical amount that I paid and I normalize for the actual cost, the market rate cost for that real estate. And so that results in another negative adjustment to EBITDA. And then lastly here, you have a COVID subsidy adjustment. So they received about $229,000 in COVID-related subsidies. Obviously, that is a one-time expense, a one-time income. It's not really related to the business operation, so that's backed out. So when you look at this, you, this is the unadjusted profit of the business. You go through all of these adjustments, and then that is really what you get as your adjusted EBITDA. And this really normalizes the performance of the business to account for what is truly the cash flow generated from this company today, just based on the operation operations, not based on all these other related party things like real estate or low salaries or, you know, one-time expenses and donations. So hopefully this is a really good recap for you. But again, if you want to get into more detail, you can go to the other video on the channel. So let's dive into it. Here's the first one. So this is the HVAC contractor. It's the EBITDA that we were, the EBITDA schedule in the last slide relates to this company. But now let's approach this from a valuation case study. 
So this company is an HVAC contractor. They primarily serve commercial markets and they're not doing installation more as repair and maintenance. So a very good recurring revenue type business. They're going and doing a lot of repeat jobs. And so typically you want to look at about, you know, three to four years of financials, maybe even longer, but here you have four years of financials. So here are the revenues. They're steadily increasing. And then this last year, something happened. It was, it actually declined. So what I typically zero in on is I look at the margins of the business. And in the part one, we talked about the profit margins, the gross margins being an indicator of pricing power. Do I have the ability to consistently charge good markup on my labor or my parts? And in this, ins in this instance, you can see here, 49%, 49%, 49.4%, 56%. 4, so really good markup on the labor for this business. Therefore, they probably have some good pricing power. Then you look at the OPEX percentage, and this is really the cost structure of the business. Has it significantly changed as the business grows? Because usually there are some fixed costs, and then there are the variable costs. And usually as a business grows, you want to see this percentage of OPEX decline over time because your fixed costs become smaller and small, smaller relative to the total size of the revenue base. So in this instance, you can see relative to 2018, 29.9%. Here they're now at about 28 0.3%. So, you know, give or take within the same range, but it's not increasing, which is a good thing because you don't want to see your cost base increase as you're growing as well, your revenues, because then really that erodes your net income and your EBITDA margin. And then lastly, once we normalize the EBITDA, which we did in the last slide, you can now see here the EBITDA percentage margin. And this is the key one that I always use. I, I look at it and I group it as three buckets. If you're sub 10%, very weak in terms of an EBITDA margin. If you're between 10 to 20%, that's pretty standard. But if you're in excess of 20% EBITDA margin, that's a really good high margin business. And therefore that results in a valuation premium. So in this instance, you can see here at 22, 23, 26%, that's a really good uh, you know, margin of, of EBITDA. And so I, I would, as I'm going through this valuation list here, as you'll see later on, that's a positive. So based on this, you know, we go back to that equation and I'm just going to flip back to these slides over here. So the enterprise value, we're going to first value the enterprise. So we've gone through, we've done the due diligence, we've normalized the EBITDA. Now we're going to determine the EBITDA multiple range. So this business does about 800,000 in EBITDA. So it really lands in this sector over here, about three to five times multiple. So really what we want to determine is what is the sustainable level of EBITDA? And when I look back here, probably not 500,000, 2019 was 827, 2020 was 981, and then 863. So it's probably within these three years, you could probably take a two-year average and safely say that's probably where it's going to land. And in this instance, we priced the business off a two-year average. So the two-year average was 922,000, and that's really where it landed. And so based on that 922, the average multiple range for the company size is three to five times based on that table. So now we have, we're at step number three. We've determined the multiple range, but that's a big range. You know, if it trades for three times 922 or five times 922, that's a significant amount. That's almost a $2 million difference in range. So our job is now to zero in on does it, will it trade at the top end of that range in the middle or the bottom end of that range? And so that's really where you get into the more specifics of the business and you go through that checklist. And so internally, I always go through this checklist when I value a company. So firstly, reason for sale. Here, the owner, 64 years old, is looking to retire. So pretty standard reason for sale, nothing to be alarmed about. So why did 2021, why was it weaker? Well, it was because of COVID and project delays. So it was really a one-time thing, and they expect to jump back to previous 900-ish levels in EBITDA. So things are coming back, and the year-to-date financials are confirming that. So really, from a performance perspective, they've steadily reported growth. There's been this uncontrolled impact of COVID, and now they're recovering from that COVID dip and they're coming back up. Okay, so that checks a positive box. Let's look at the customers and the suppliers. So here, you can see that there's a lot of actually customer concentration. There's about 31% of all their revenues comes from one customer. The second one is 22%, the third is 12%. So this is significant customer concentration. We're talking about 65% of their business coming from 
three customers. So when you look at this, this is a negative impact on the valuation because yes, you know, maybe for a big strategic company, you're just buying the customer book and, you know, it rolls into a bigger pool of, uh, of customers. So it's not as risky. But if I'm an independent investor buying this business as my platform, as my first deal, why well, look at this and say that's significant transition risk? Because if that one customer leaves, the difference in value of this business changes so significantly. From the supplier side, similarly, there is also customer concentra uh, supplier cost concentration. 40% of the business comes from this one supplier. So really, it's important to dig in to understand, is the supplier really critical? Are they giving me preferred terms and I'm getting way better costs from anyone else? Or can I go to someone else and probably get very similar pricing and therefore it's not going to really change fundamentally my profit margin on, on the products that I'm buying? So in this instance, because I know the company and we've worked with them, there was some sort of advantage with the supplier, but it was not significant. So a lot of the times the buyers, you know, they're less concerned with supplier concentration versus customer concentration. Now, if this supplier was making 80, 90% of their purchases, that would be a different story. But at 40% for a small business, especially in a niche space, this was fairly standard and, and, and buyers really didn't blink an eye at the supplier side, but they did at the, uh, at the customer side. So now we go through the list. So Firstly, the industry. The industry is a good industry. The outlook is good. Uh, the seller them, themselves were willing to accept terms. So obviously from a buyer point of view, we wanted to mitigate some of the customer concentration risk. And because the seller is willing to accept terms, that provided that ease, ease their comfort in terms of, okay, the seller is willing to stand by the deal and sell and share in that risk. Was the, was the seller organized and did they have accurate financials? Yes, they did. You know, the buyer could go to the bank and borrow funds against the business. And then lastly, who is really kind of the ideal buyer for this business? Was it a financial buyer? Was it strategic? And in this process, it was primarily financial buyers because at this size, the strategics were not really interested in such a small business. They were looking for larger scale to buy. So it was ultimately a financial buyer that came in and bought this business. And so naturally, they're paying a lower premium relative to a strategic buyer. So those are kind of the more fundamental high-level drivers. The sector, the status of the seller to accept terms, whether it's a bankable deal and you can get financing on the deal, and what type of buyer is ultimately involved in the process or what was the ideal type of buyer. And now you get into the specifics. So... We talked about customer and supplier concentration. On both sides, there was concentration. So that's viewed as a value limiter. The owner, oops, the owner, um, you know, was involved in pricing, in sales, and in finance. And so they all, that's, those were all pretty key roles within the organization, which also limited the value of the business because there's a huge transition risk involved. If they're doing all the pricing, they're selling to all the major customers, they're managing all the financial tasks. That means that they're wearing multiple hats and maybe you actually need to hire two people instead of one to fill that position. So from the buyer's point of view, when they saw that, they actually saw that as a value negative. In terms of the transition risk, the seller was willing to stay on longer, around one year and more, and they're also willing to provide a VTB to, to provide those terms necessary to transition the business. So it was able to mitigate some of the key owner risk, but how much is ultimately up to the buyer and their willingness to accept that risk. So I would mark that up as TBD. Now, from a pricing power perspective, gross margin was high, EBITDA was really good. So the margins look good, and therefore the premium pricing for their services was strong. So with those high margins, you know, buyers typically like to see that. So that was actually a value driver, a value positive. From a historical financial performance perspective, they were steadily growing. Then they fell off because of COVID, and now they're coming back. So in a way, it's understandable why. It wasn't because they lost market share or a customer left. It was just because of this, you know, one-time event. But at the same time, you know, buyers still look at the last year and, and put a lot of importance in where the business is today versus where they, where they were in the past. So there was a bit of a balancing act there. Taking that two-year average was a bit of a negotiation, but ultimately buyers bought into that. But some buyers may be spooked by that decline. So ultimately, I, I would put that up as a TBD. Some buyers may see that as a value driver because ultimately it is growing still and it's recovering, whereas others saw that decline as, hey, you know, this business is susceptible to declines because of COVID and other external events like that. In terms of the cost of growth, this is a service-based business. And so we talked about this in part one. Asset-heavy businesses that require a lot of CapEx to grow, 
that's typically seen as a negative from the buyer's point of view because that's a true cost. Every single year or two or three years, I have to spend more and more money on equipment to grow. Whereas in a business like this, I have 10 technicians, I have some trucks on the road, and that's it. So really, there's very little capex required to grow the business. So that's naturally seen as a value driver. When you look at the stickiness of customers, these customers were highly repeat. And so that's why I looked at the three year performance of these customers. They were all steadily growing in size and the top three customers have been with this company for a very long time. So the stickiness of the customers, their ability to come back and their desire to come back was very strong. So these were highly repeat customers. They weren't contracted, but they were repeat. And therefore that's still seen as a value positive value driver. In terms of the space, in this business, you know, you don't need a lot of space. Now, you know, they probably could need a little bit more space to store the trucks outside. And as they're growing, they may need to take on more uh, uh, space externally. But ultimately, there is not a lot of challenges around the real estate and the capacity to grow on the real estate side. So I would mark that up as TD, TBD. It doesn't really push the value up, but it doesn't push the value down. In terms of new customers, the owner was very laid back. They were servicing their existing customers very well, and they wanted to continue serving their existing customers, but they were not pursuing new customers. Therefore, ultimately, while there was some interest from new new business, uh, new business uh, customers, the owner did not go after new business. So for some buyers, they see that as a positive because that means low-hanging fruit. For others, it means, well, why aren't you going after more customers? I want you to demonstrate to me that you can take on more customers. So I'd mark that as, as TBD and or a value driver. And then in terms of the competition in the marketplace, there was a lot of big fish. They were competing with a lot of big players. And so competition was high. Even though the, they had good pricing power, they had good sticky customers, you know, they could lose those customers tomorrow if, you know, they, they drop the ball on a project. And so ultimately competition in the sector was higher than usual. And that was a value limiter. And then lastly, for room for growth in this business, capacity is related to technicians. If you have a lot of technicians in the field, you can take on more work. If you don't, you know, you can't take on more work. So for these guys and their team of 10 technicians, they were almost fully maxed out. They were running at about a 90% utilization of their existing team. So to really grow this business, they would need to find more skilled labor, which is really difficult in the current marketplace. So a lot of buyers looked at that and say, that's a negative. So going through that list, this is really how you think about valuing a business. You take the financials, you look at the business fundamentals, you look at the customer and supplier performance, and then you put yourselves in the shoes of a buyer in, in really weighing multiple categories within that business, customer, transition, growth, opportunity to grow, new business, competition, everything. And you're weighing and you're balancing between value drivers and value limiters to zero in on a multiple range. So at a high level, that big broad range was three to five, but ultimately majority of the buyers would land within that four to four and a half times multiple range based on these value drivers and limiters. So hopefully that was a good enough explanation. And this is really how you would value the enterprise value of the business. Now, looking to the excess, value, excess balance sheet value, so the EV was addressed in the previous slide. Now we're looking at the balance sheet. So here's the balance sheet for the contractor as of closing, okay? So they had about cash, about 321000 accounts receivable, inventory, prepaid expenses. Uh, they had the accounts payable, accrued liabilities of 198000 So ultimately, through negotiation and analysis, we determined that really the required networking capital for this business was $500,000. And so based on that, you know, it's a cash-free, debt-free uh, transaction. So they had no debt and they had cash of $321,000. So the seller was able to take the $321,000 out of the business. Then the non-cash current assets, which are accounts receivable, inventory, and prepaid assets. So these three numbers totaled $760,000. And then the non-debt current liabilities of 198, the accounts payable and accrued liabilities, resulted in a 760 minus 198, 561,000 net working capital, current assets minus current liabilities. And because we determined that the target was 500,000 in this instance, really they were carrying about 61-ish thousand dollars in excess working capital above the target. So you take the cash, plus or minus any debt that would needs to be paid back in this case, zero, plus the excess networking capital on the books, which was 61,000. And so really the value, in addition to the purchase price of the enterprise value, the value on the balance sheet was about another 383,000. So really 
Now we put those two together and now we can really zero in on a good valuation range for this business. So we know that the multiple range for the EBITDA was four to 4.5 times. We decided to take a two year average because we didn't wanna sell off the, this recent down year because they're coming back, but we're not gonna sell off the last strong year. So we're kind of taking something in the middle, an average of two years. So we're taking a two year average of 922,000 and we're multiplying 922, times four gives us an enterprise value of 3.689 plus the excess balance sheet value of 383 gives us a total value of four million dollars out of four times and similarly if you run it at a four and a half times multiple that gives you a 4.5 million dollar valuation so the value of this business if you're to go to open market is anywhere from probably about four to 4.5 4.5 million dollars and that's really how you think through the valuation of a company Okay, so hopefully this was really helpful for you. We're now going to go and I'm going to kind of hopefully speed this up a little bit as we go through number two. So number two, here's a metal fabricator. Okay, so these guys are making metal components and, you know, CNC precision fabrication with their brake presses. And they're making these machines um, for mining, forestry, automotive, and healthcare applications. The owner is 66 years old and is looking to retire. Here is the growth of this business. Over the last four years, they've almost doubled. And the challenge with these kind of businesses is that the question is, is that growth sustainable? And you know, how do I think through the sustainability of that growth? So you can see in 2018 at 3.5, they were doing gross margins in 27%. Their OPEX was 22%. Their EBITDA was only 3.4%. Very low margin EBITDA on this kind of revenues. But then as they've grown and they've benefited from the growth of their customers in key, key markets, that EBITDA has also grown to about 750,000, landing at about 12%, which for a manufacturing type entity, 10 to 15% is usually what you see as market. It's not good, it's not bad, it's just market and that's the average. So how do you think through valuing this? Do you value it off this number or do you value it off this number? Or do you value it on something in between? Ultimately, that depends on the analysis of the company. And so what you really wanna look at is you wanna look at the customers and seeing their run rates and their growth. So that's why I added the industry um, column here. So customer one, which makes up about 13.9% of their business is in the mining space. The forestry space is the second and the mining space again is the third. And these guys combined make up just under about 30% of revenues. And they've been a big driver of growth. You can see 3.7 to 7.7, 6.2 to 13.9%. So all of these volumes have almost doubled and or doubled. So these have been the primary drivers of the revenue growth in the business. And so really the question is those sectors, is growth expected to continue? Is this really a cyclical cycle right now that we're seeing? And so commodity prices are high, high and they may come down because of inflation or whatever macro factors. Those are the things that you need to think about as you're going through this to understand how sustainable is this kind of hockey stick growth for this business. Ultimately, when we went to market with a business like this, we saw that, you know, a lot of buyers understood that the business was probably not at, at 2018 level, but probably this last year was really, really strong and they were unsure whether you know, that would happen again. So a two-year average was taken once again. And in this instance, the two-year average between these two numbers is about 690,000. And that was the benchmark used for valuation. So based on the 690, where does that land? If you go again to that table, it lands in a very similar three to five times valuation range. Now we go through the macro and company specific factors to land on a more specific value range within that broad range. So you look at metal fabrication, the sector is fairly mature. There's not a lot of exciting new technologies and growth. It's a steady, eddy, boring sector, which for a lot of people is interesting and or, and or good to buy, but it's also not going to drive a lot of significant growth. The seller is willing to accept terms, give about 20% of the purchase price in the form of an earnout, allowing the buyer to reset the price if they're unable to sustain this level of EBITDA, which is really good because the seller is putting their money where their mouth is by providing that earnout. Now, when you look at the organized financials, they as well were organized. They had review engaged financials prepared by an accountant. So it was a bankable deal. In terms of the anticipated buyer, businesses like this, where there's a lot of expertise required to manufacture something, the challenge is that there's not a lot of financial buyers for them. 
there may be some operators that have, have been in the space before that maybe have some money to invest. But in most instances, it actually leans towards a strategic versus a financial buyer because the financial buyers, you know, just don't have that expertise. So in this instance, there was no real clear cut buyer. It was kind of a mismatch of different types of buying groups. So it was really difficult to determine whether there would be a strategic premium associated with a strategic buyer focus, or if it was just more of a standalone financial buyer. So let's say TBD for now. Now, when you look at customer supplier concentration, none of these customers were above 20, 25% of the annual revenues. So it was okay. You know, same thing on the supplier side, 26.1%, 14 and 11%. These were all metal suppliers and they were interchangeable completely interchangeable. It's a commoditized supplying space. So it's not like, you know, if supplier number one went away, they couldn't get more from supplier number two. They absolutely could. So the switching costs were very minimal. And therefore, from a customer and supplier perspective, you know, there was no risk. And, you know, there was a bit of a more value driver. In terms of the industries, the customer industries were questionable. Automotive, mining, and forestry are all cyclical sectors. And in some instances, investors don't want to get involved with those sectors because they know there are years when it's really high, but there are also those lower years which they want to avoid. So in this instance, it was a bit of a value limiter. The key owner, the owner that was involved, did all the pricing and managed the shop and managed key projects. So they were very involved in the business, which again, limited the value of the business. So the transition risk, because of the key owner risk, because of the cyclicality of the end markets, there was significant transition risk. In addition, in this instance, the seller didn't want to stay on longer than six months. They wanted a very rapid exit. Usually most buyers expect you to stay around for a year. If you stay for six months only, or you only want to exit quicker than that, that sends the wrong message to the buyer, which ultimately resulted in a value limiter for this business. From a pricing power perspective, the business is very weak, right? 3%, 8%, 11 12%. It's been ramping up. But even now, as, as you know, the, the, the economy in their end markets is doing well, they're only netting 12% EBITDA on the business, which for a manufacturing entity is on the bottom end of average. So really, I would still define this as a value limiter. If they were doing 17 18%, that'd be a little different, or 20%, very good. But at 12 it's on the bottom end of, of the average size. Uh, in terms of historical performance, this is a TBD, right? Again, you go back to, is this sustainable? If this is now going to go 7, 8, 9, 10 million, that's great, okay? But on the flip side, if this is the top and it's going to fall down to 4 next year, the buyer is going to be in a tough pickle. So in most instances, buyers will, depending on their risk tolerance, determine whether that's a value limiter or a value driver. So let's put that up as TBD. In terms of cost of growth, Unlike an asset light business, this is an asset heavy business. They need to replace their CNC, which costs about 500,000 in the next two years. So buyers are already marketing that up as a future cost of the business, which ultimately gets factored into the valuation, which lowers the valuation. In terms of stickiness of, of customers, very RFP based. You know, they have to bid on every single job that comes up from their key customers. So there's not a lot of stickiness. There's not a lot of high switching costs. So that again is another value limiter. In terms of the space, they had about 25,000 square feet. They owned the space and they had room to grow. So in this instance, they could grow some more, but the cost of growth was significant. So I would mark that up as a TBD. In terms of new customers, they could win more business if they wanted to. If they could go into the open market and get more RFPs, adjust their pricing a little bit, they could win more revenues. So ultimately, that's not a value limiter. It's more of a value driver because there's room for growth. There's a lot of activity in this space today. However, because of that, there's a lot of competition in the space. So there are a lot of shops out there that are looking to win those same jobs. So competition is high, which limits the value of the business. And then ultimately, we talked about this on the real estate side, they had room to grow. The existing equipment and the existing facility, they were at about 65% utilization within the current business today, which is a value driver because you could, if you're a strategic and you want to drop more work into it, that could scale up quickly without, without adding a lot more real estate space to accommodate that growth. So ultimately, when you kind of take all of these things in here, this business was kind of in the bottom middle portion of this scale. They're not maybe trading for four times, but kind of in that 3.5 to four times range. For sure, not a five times multiple because of all these value limiters, but as well, there are some value drivers, good customers that are growing, uh, you know, room for growth, uh, a lot of room uh, in the industry and a lot of activity. So the outlook was decent. Uh, so it wasn't a three times multiple either. So it kind of landed within that three and a half to four times multiple for the business.
Okay, so similarly, now we go to the balance sheet. So we look at the balance sheet as of closing. You have the cash, accounts receivable, inventory, prepaid expenses. Similarly, they had accounts payable. And here they had about $715,000 in long-term debt associated with equipment that they bought. So in this instance, on a cash-free, debt-free basis, they would take out the $458,000 in cash, but they'd have to also pay out the $715,000 in debt on the books. So that would actually result in a net negative in terms of them having to pay, using the purchase price to pay out all the debt on the books. Now, in terms of the non-cash current assets, so AR, inventory, prepaid expenses, that was 848000 Now, the non-debt non current liabilities was 451 So the net working capital, the, this minus this, is 397 But when you look at the historical performance of the business and what they really need to operate this business, actually the required amount of working capital was 450,000. They were running at a deficit level. Their actual was 397 as a closing, but the target that we negotiated was 450,000. So ultimately there was a deficit of 52,000 on the working capital side. So when you take cash minus debt and then include the deficit, that results in a negative balance sheet value of 309 here. Now, if they had a lot of cash to pay out the debt and there was just a minimal amount of deficit, maybe it net out to zero, but because they didn't have a lot of cash and they were running a networking capital deficit, this was actually negative value for the business. So now we merge the enterprise with the balance sheet value. So 3.5 to four times multiple on a two-year average benchmark of 690,000 gives you 2.4 to 2.7. And then you include the deficit, the negative balance sheet value, which gives you your net total value of the business of anywhere from 2.1 to 2.4 million dollars. And that's really how the valuation for this business shaked out. Okay, so let's look at the opposite, a really fast growing, sizable business in the renovation space. So they de dealt with kitchens, bathrooms, closets, very desirable business. So here you can see that revenues have been growing significantly from 6.6 .6 to 11.6 million. Now, unlike the previous business, there is clear proof that they've won new market share, they've added customers, they've won new contracts, they're growing and they're investing. They're just, they've just demonstrated successfully that this is sustainable growth. The pricing power is very good in the kind of 47, 48, 43, 43% range. Their OPEX structure has been declining as the growth has been increasing, confirming that their cost structure is variable and is not growing too significantly. And then their EBITDA margin is also very healthy, above 20%. And then this last year, they did 27.5% or 3.2 million EBITDA. It was a sizable business. Full management team in place, really good customer relationships, exclusive positions. So, you know, you look at this right away and you just put it based on the size of the EBITDA, this trades for anywhere from five to seven times EBITDA. Okay, so very different than a sub million dollar EBITDA business. Now, you look at the market growth, a lot of they're serving a lot of home builders, they're working with a lot of commercial developers. But there's not a lot of significant customer concentration. So all their customers are growing steadily, you know, kind of incrementally over the years. But the concentration of their top customers is very minimal, meaning that they have a diverse amount of, of uh, customer base. On the supply side, they are working the top two suppliers are key suppliers to them. But they have contracts with those suppliers. So it's a little unique. Yes, they're getting an advantageous pricing. And if they were to lose supplier number one, their margins would probably decline because of the, you know, the favorable rebates in place today. But there's contracts in place to protect that relationship. So the question is, will that supplier go away or will they be able to live and, and, and continue on to for this fruitful partnership. So that's something to do an analysis. But now looking at the overarching value of this business, we look at the outlook again of the sector, home services, the real estate market is doing really well. So the outlook is very strong. The seller is also willing to accept terms anywhere from 10 to 30% with a portion of it in rolled equity and reinvested equity. So they want to stay in as a minority partner. In addition, they also would be willing to accept a vendor note. So really good um, you know, reinvestment terms. It's a bankable deal, very good organized financials, review engaged financials. And then the buyer is going to be a strategic buyer. So someone in the space already, meaning that there's gonna be a premium associated with the strategic buyer instead of just a pure financial investor coming in.
So you go through the list, no customer concentration. We talked about suppliers. There's contracts in place, but there is concentration. So TBD, more information is needed. There's very little owner risk. They are involved in some sales, but they have a general manager, sales leader, a finance leader, very good middle management team. So there's very minimal day-to-day -day transition risk for the new ownership group. So that's a positive. And then the pricing power is very good at 20 plus percent EBITDA margins. There's a 27.5% EBITDA margin in the last year. That's a really, really healthy EBITDA margin for this sector. So that's a value driver. In terms of the historical performance, they've been growing, seems to be sustainable. The market seems to continue to grow. There's a lot of demand for it. So there is good growth, but ultimately that depends on the buyer if they're comfortable with the outlook in the sector. In terms of the pipeline, to get a feel for where the business is going to go ne next year, they have the ability to look forward to their next projects in the next 9 to 12 months. So they know with confidence that in the next 9 to 12 months, about 75% of this year's past year's revenues are already booked for next year, which is a really good positive when buyers are questioning, oh, where's this business going next year? Where is it trending? Well, here's booked projects in the pipeline that are guaranteed. Again, that's a big value driver for the business. Now, the challenge with a lot of high growth businesses is that the cost to grow or the room for growth is limited. And for this business, that is the case. They need about another 20,000 square feet to really grow the business. And so that's going to cost. That's a true cost to the buyer moving forward that will have to get factored into the purchase price. But the customers are sticky. They're in good exclusive relationships. They're typically contracted relationships that last for one to two years. So that's a big value driver. The space itself right now, again, they have space, they own it, but they're going to need more space. So again, TBD or value, value limiter. In terms of new customers, the problem with this business is that the sales cycle is very long. So if you wanted to grow and add more new customers, it, it's actually going to take a little bit of time to add new accounts, which is a bit of a value limiter. But there is a lot of room for growth. Today, You know, the, the, the split between commercial and retail markets is 80-20. And they have the ability to grow their secondary division of retail that is still in the infancy stages. So really, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit for this business to grow the business. In terms of the competition, they're the biggest in the local market. They're the go-to provider. There's very minimal competition, which again is a value driver. And then lastly, when you look at room for growth, again, because they need more space, they're running at about 90 to 100% utilization at any time. So they're going to need to expand capacity if they really want to double the size of this business to $6 million in EBITDA, which is, again, a, a cost of the buyer, and they're going to factor that into their valuation. So ultimately, where does this business really trade for? A lot of positives. I would say this is not a seven times business, simply because seven times on a $3 million EBITDA business, you usually see seven times on four or five million EBITDA businesses, three million, you're, you're in that five to six range usually, but this is at the top end of that five to six range. So I would say kind of five and a half to six times. And ultimately this business did trade for a six times multiple for a business of this size. So really in this instance, I would peg this business, a lot of good value drivers, but mm, very difficult to probably get seven, maybe in the low sixes, but in the high fives, low sixes is really at best. You could, you know, probably a really good valuation range. So especially with high growth businesses, it's sometimes really difficult to peg that range because it may be the perfect buyer for, strate uh, for a strategic buyer. But at the same time, you don't want to overestimate the value of your business and then scare off people because they think, oh, this person is expecting too much for the business. So you kind of want to be reasonable within that kind of six times range. So that's really where the business ultimately traded for. So going through the balance sheet valuation, these guys had very minimal cash, you know, because a lot of the cash went back into working capital and they had significant debt on the books, about 1.2 million for equipment. So ultimately, you know, there was, they were going to have to use part of the purchase price, the enterprise value to pay out the debt on the books. And then in terms of the networking capital, the target was about 1.65 million based on the analysis. And when you look at the actual networking capital, there's about 1.824 million. So there was excess networking capital of 174, but then they had to still pay out the net debt, which was well above that excess amount. So the balance sheet value was actually a negative of 935 in this instance. But when you apply the most recent year's EBITDA, because this business is growing, continuing to grow, and most buyers will pay off the most recent year for high growth businesses, you know, if you do a 5.5 to six times multiple on that benchmark of 3.2 million, 
and then you add in the balance sheet value, the negative balance sheet value of 935,000, that gives you a valuation range of about 16.7 to 18.3 million. And it trained it at the top end of that range ultimately. So the fourth and final company we're gonna be talking about is the opposite. This is a declining business. Uh, that is facing secular and also technology challenges. So this is a print and marketing company that primarily serves retail customers, making direct marketing flyers and packages and decals that would go in stores. And unfortunately, as these customers are pivoting towards more digital marketing efforts, naturally their business is shrinking. And so therefore the pie is shrinking in the industry. And it's, it's the expectation is that the business will not come back to previous levels. So you can see in 2018, the business was doing about 8.7 million. It's now only doing 5.7 million. And so their EBITDA has come down from 1.4 to 580,000. So almost a third of the EBITDA from four years ago. So naturally you can see this is a bit of a falling knife situation. So how do you value this business? Ultimately, the only real buyers for this company would be other strategics. Financial investors would not step into such a situation unless they saw very, very distressed valuations. But for a financial buyer, it may make sense to consolidate the facility, uh, terminate some employees, buy the customer book, and maybe get a bit of a lift off that 580K. So really, this business is probably only a fit for investors in it within the same industry. And when it looks at when you're thinking about benchmarks in the situation, it would only really make sense to price off the last year or the TTM EBITDA of that business because every single month or every single year the EBITDA is declining. So they're not going to give you the credit as the buyer of past years. It's really the last year and the most recent TTM performance. Now, looking at this business, what's unique about it is that the relationships are actually contracted. So that you are have fixed relationships that customers have to come back to you and go through you. And so you have some, you know, pretty sizable accounts here at 19, 17%, 10%, but they're declining, but they are contracted. So it's kind of, there's a positive and a negative to it. So when you look at the valuation of this business, once again, 580,000, that's within the three to five times multiple range, but the sector itself is declining. The print sector is declining. Uh, the vendor is willing to provide some terms, which is good to transition some of that risk from the buyer to share in the risk. Um, in terms of the financials, they're accurate, they're bankable, review engaged by the accountant, but the buyer is only going to be a strategic. And in this instance, while most situations strategic buyers will pay a premium, when it's a company that's declining or in a sector where um, you know it's in a secular decline, it's quite the opposite. It's a double-edged sword because, funny enough, the strategics are facing the same issue. So they know the skeletons in the closet. They know that it's only going to get more and more challenging. So they're actually probably the smartest buyers when it comes to pricing that risk. And so in these situations, they actually pay even lower than what a financial investor may consider paying if there was a financial investor at the table. So when you look at kind of the value drivers here, customer concentration is sub that 25%, so it's okay. In addition, it's contracted, so you're protected in terms of those relationships, but the volumes are declining again due to the technology challenges. There's IP ownership, so they do have some programs in-house that they've developed and they sell to store data for their customers, which is unique and again, valuable. So that's something that they own in-house and that's a value driver. The owner themselves, they're not involved in the business. There is established middle management uh, with very minimal owner involvement. He actually works less than five, 10 hours a week in the company. So when you look at the transition risk, you have contracted relations, you own the IP, you have good middle management. So the transition risk is very low. And, and therefore, all four of these are good value drivers. The challenge with this business though is because it's declining, your pricing power it decreases. So you, as you see here, the EBITDA is declining from 16 to 10%. In addition, the gross margin is going down from 29 to 24%. And that's because, again, you have high fixed costs because of the building and the, and the operating and the equipment. And as revenues are declining, your margins and your profit margins are being compressed, which is putting increased pressure on their pricing. So the pricing power is a negative in the situation. The historical performance is declining, it's not bound to improve. And the cost of growth, to really modernize the facility to try to keep up with competition, they'd really need to invest another $750,000 into a, a printing press, which again is a cost to the future owner, unless they had that printing press in house already. When you look at the cost of growth, they have a lot of space. It's a 60,000 square foot facility, and they're probably only using 20, 25,000 square feet. So there's a lot of plentiful room to grow, but again, can you really find 
more revenues in a declining market. When it comes to the stickiness of customers, the customers are contracted, so that is a bit of a value positive, but these new customers, again, majority of these customers are either declining or they're going bankrupt. And so in certain situ situations with the COVID, uh, some of their customers even went bankrupt. So they lost about 10 to 15% of their customers on an annual basis. So customer churn is very poor for this business, which is a value limiter. There's a very limited growth areas. Competition in the market is low simply because there's not a lot of players left in the marketplace, but there's not a lot of room to grow even though there's low competition. So that in a way is almost negated. And then lastly, yes, there's a lot of room to grow. You have the utilization of only 35% today. You have the excess space, but that keeps going back to the macro challenges of this industry. So while there are some value drivers that are pushing up the, the valuation, what's really overridden in this, in this instance here is that the business is facing secular challenges that are unavoidable. So ultimately, this would train at the bottom end of the range and would trade off of the most recent TTM EBITDA benchmark, which in this case would be 580000 and so when you look at that three to five times multiple range, this would probably trade for three to maybe three and a half times, and ultimately probably would be on the bottom end of that. Now, when you look at the value of the balance sheet, in this instance, they've well, they had a plentiful amount of cash. Over the years, they've been profitable. Uh, not a lot of expenditure, but they do have some debt on the books as well. So you have about $1.5 million in cash, about a million dollars in debt against equipment. So they would pay out the debt and they'd have net cash of about 500000 When you look at the working capital, the required working capital for this business is very minimal, actually, because there's a significant amount of AP offsetting the AR and inventory in the business. So historically, they were probably running at about a net working capital level of 25000 and when you look at the accounts receivable inventory and prepaid expenses, that's about $1 million. And then the accrued payables and, uh, and accounts payables, they, that is about 964000 So their actual current net working capital is 81000 So there's a bit of an excess there, 56000 plus the net outstanding cash balance left. That gives you a balance sheet value of 598000 in this instance. So you take that benchmark value of 580000 in EBITDA, you multiply by three times, that gives you about 1.7 plus the excess balance sheet value of 598 gives you 2.3 to 2.6 million dollars and this is really where the business ultimately traded for at the bottom end of that range and thankfully enough in this situation the business had some balance sheet value so the owner really wanted more to monetize walk away from the liabilities because in situations where a business is declining in value really the owner's concerns are the liabilities of owner of of terminating employees and, and liquidating the business what is what is the alternative do i liquidate the business sell off the equipment and incur the severance costs or do i try to sell this business for however little i can get for it get the balance sheet value for myself and then walk away from the severance liabilities and so this in this instance they had 60 plus employees with probably tw average tenure of 20 years there was a significant severance liability there and the liquidation value was so low that when you kind of added the two together it made more sense just to sell the business and walk away from the severance liability so really the true value for this company is not only the 2.3 but it's the potential cost that they avoided by not incurring that severance liability in a, in a declining business scenario. So hopefully you found the video helpful. I know it was quite detailed, but uh, wanted to kind of walk you through a steady situation, a high growth situation, a declining situation, and show you how I think through valuation. And this is really the approach that I would use when I'm helping either a client on the buy side or the sell side to really approach a uh, company's valuation. And this is really relevant for lower mid-market companies where there's not a lot of public information. There's not a lot of comparable transactions. So ultimately, you're trying to take broad ranges and make it specific to that company by applying specific company fundamentals and the value limiters and drivers for those businesses. So if you found the video helpful, please do like and subscribe to the channel. And if you have any questions, reach out through LinkedIn or through my website at Robley Capital, where I can kind of help you with your uh, business valuation as well. So thank you guys and have a great day.